صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد We've been asked to uh, make a dua this evening especially being Thursday night We've been told in the media from many of the different agencies around the world that the terrorists who are trying to take over Syria are coming in number especially to the second city of Halab I told also that the government forces are coming forward in order to defend the city. The suggestions are that it will be a very large-scale battle for this city. We can imagine that many people will be killed, slaughtered unjustly from both sides as well. And therefore we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together that there is safety and security and peace very, very quickly within Syria and all else around the world. Please raise your hands, join us in da'a. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المصر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المصر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المصر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المصطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المصطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله بفضلك وبرحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين سلوات الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد قال إمام الحج عليه السلام الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالك الإصباح ديان الدين رب العالمين سلوات الله سلام ماست فري جمام الزمانة my respected teachers elders brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته the next section in Da'a Iftitah, which comes to us from the awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam al Hajjah Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif, says Alhamdulillahi Malik al Mulk, Mujri al Fulk, Musakhir al Riyah, Falik al Isbah, Dayan al Deen, Rabb al Alameen. The translation is as such Alhamdulillahi Malik al Mulk. 
All praise belongs to Allah, for He is the owner of the kingdom. Mujril fulk And He sets in the courses that which goes forth, that which floats, that which goes forth in ships. He is the one who sets the direction of the winds. He is the one who opens the daybreak. He is the one who administers the authority. He is Lord of the worlds. And we praise Him for all of these particular actions or qualities therein. Our discussion tonight, inshallah, will take a slightly different tangent as to how we have taken them on the previous nights. As many of us have been attending the day sessions and the tafsir, we have been looking at the construct, pondering upon the Holy Qur'an. We have taken the concept as to why pondering upon the Holy Qur'an is so important, or indeed pondering upon anything. And then also we have been taking the ideas that before we can ponder, there needs to be certain background knowledges, sciences, practices that are within ourselves in order that we may build upon them. The analogy that we have been giving over the days is that just like here in this very Imam Bargha, there needs to be a very strong foundation. And when you have a strong foundation, you can build upon it. Similarly, before we ponder upon the Holy Quran, there are certain requisites that we need. And then once we practice this, pondering will become second nature to us. It will become part and parcel of our normal daily recitation, be it Qur'an or indeed du'a. And thus we also want to extend this concept of pondering, not just the Qur'an, but to du'a itself. Because what we have been doing is we have been pondering upon the Holy Qur'an, in, in, uh, we have been pondering upon this du'a iftitah within these sessions. We've been asking pertinent questions. What is the root word of such and such a thing? How is it been applicable? How does it manifest itself on a personal level? How does it manifest itself on a social level? How does the Imam understand it from his perspective? What does Allah Ta'ala understand it from his perspective? And so on and so forth. These are the questions and the constructs as to how pondering takes place. And you and I now, inshallah, this evening, we want to become more granular. What do we mean granular? We mean that we want to go into the very fundamental questions that we ask when we ponder. And therefore, we want to apply these questions to this particular section of the iftita. What we will do, inshallah, time permitting, is that we will look at the verse or these sections of the du'a from a face value perspective. And we will really delve into the level of understanding what Imam is trying to state when he says, Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk. Take the lessons from the very literal meaning of it. However, having understood the literal meaning, when you and I ponder, what are the different questions we can pose to such a statement within the du'a, and thereby what can we extract from the different meanings of it? In the idea that we can learn how to ponder ourselves, we want this to become second nature, learn how to apply various questions, be it to Qur'an, be it to du'a, be it to any ahadith that we come across in our lives, we want to apply various questions in order to extract various levels of meanings. So the line at hand, Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk. All praise belongs to Allah. Why? Because He is the owner of the kingdom. Now when you and I ponder upon anything, especially when it comes to the holy Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them all, we are talking about a group of individuals that their body, their mind, their heart, their soul is entirely mixed with the Holy Qur'an. Meaning when they speak, when they think, when they act, it is entirely based upon the words, the commandments, the lessons, the messages from the Holy Qur'an. Hence, when I look at any tradition, if I look at any of the ahadith from any of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, or I look at any line from any du'a mentioned by them, in order for me to understand how they are explaining this particular verse, how they interpret and mean this particular verse, because they are the light of the Qur'an, I must go back to Qur'an to see where this particular word is mentioned in order to understand how they mean it. That means anytime I see a verse, anytime I see a line, anytime I see anything from them, they are speaking through the Qur'an. The commander of the faithful has this famous line when he talks about Ahlul Bayt, in particular himself, 
that they are Quran and Natiq. They are the speaking Quran. And the Quran technically is silent. It is the letters, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, who make these words come alive. Hence, if I want to understand anything from dua, I need to check where this word is mentioned within Quran. And this way I will firstly be able to exhibit and understand how the Imams wanted us to understand this word. Alhamdulillah al Malik al Mulk. Where do we find this within the Hud Quran? As an example, we find within Surah Al Imran a very famous verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the owner of all. And He gives this kingdom to whom He wishes, and He takes this kingdom from whom He wishes. Qul al Malik al Mulk, Tu'ti al Mulk. He is the one who owns all of this kingdom. Everything in existence belongs to him. By virtue, it is his right to give to whom he wills. And once he has given, it is his right to take this back from whomsoever he wills. Hence, when we read this first line of this dua, Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk, Mujr al-Fulk, Musakhir al I'm obliged to see through the Quranic context. This is the first thing I do when I ponder. Having then seen that the concept of this kingdom is described by Allah as the one who gives to whom he wills and takes back from whom he wills. I now need to understand what this particular sentence means in order for me to apply it to da'a iftitah, alhamdulillah al-malik al-mulk. This is the way pondering works. This is the stage by stage process. One, I need to see where the word is found within the Holy Quran. I reconcile it with Quran. Two, having found it from Quran, I need to understand what Quran is saying about that word. Quran says he is Malik al-Mulk. He gives to whom he wills, now he takes from whom he wills. What does this mean? That he gives and he takes. And where else in Quran do we understand this particular sentence? We find that when it comes to our own lives, when we just reflect for a few minutes, whether you are 18, whether you are 30, whether you are 60 or 70 years old within this crowd, we have all been through our own personal trials and tribulations. We have all been given by Allah Ta'ala and we have all been taken back by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. What can we be given and what can be taken back by Him? If He is the owner, what can He give to me and what can He take back? He can give to me wealth. All the wealth in this universe is technically owned by Him. Hence, when we talk about zakat, and when we talk about khums, and when we talk about sadaqah, we are purifying our wealth. But whom does it belong to? It really belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I have earned 1,000 pounds at the end of the year, and I have the responsibility of paying 20% khums upon it, really I'm paying Allah's money back into the system which He has ordained. It's not really my money. He has loaned it to me so that I may do good by that particular money. He gives and he can take. He may also give to me good health. In the same time, he may take away that very same health that he has given to me. He may give to me business. At the same time, he may decide to take away business from me. He may give to me family. And indeed, we have seen many of our own friends and family who have lost so many of their family members. He gives and he takes away at the very same time. By virtue of realization, we realize that Allah Ta'ala is the one who is in complete control. I don't have a say in these matters. How quickly wealth comes and indeed how quickly wealth can leave me as well. And as such, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has an outstanding psychological verse in the Holy Quran whereby he wants us to realize how we must react in any given situation when he gives and when he takes because we experience both hence we need to realize how we react when we are falling upon both circumstances in surah al hadid verses 21 22 23 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lists a series of issues that are there for the mind and the heart in regards to psychology why do we bring this up because you find that many of us are going through these trials and tribulations. Many of our friends have gone through these trials and tribulations. We need to become aware as to how best to react in these circumstances. 
also how to advise others how to react within these circumstances. We find Surah Al-Hadid has a very famous insight. After the door fell upon her eminence, Lady Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa alayha, She is lying on her deathbed. As she's lying upon her deathbed, the commander of the faithful comes to sit beside her. You can imagine what it must be like as a husband now having to try to see your dear wife, and not just any wife, this grand lady of humanity, the leader of all women of all nations in all times, lying in such pain, devastated by the tragedy that befalls her. But her being a woman, having such love within her heart, her mind is going towards the commander of the faithful. Her mind is what will the commander of the faithful be feeling like. And as such, our ahadith tell us that just before she passes away from this world, she gives some advice. Ya Ali, when I pass away from this world, you will be devastated. You will be hurt. The heart will be in such pain by what has happened. I advise you to read Surah Al-Hadid. Why? Because in here, these verses are verses of psychology. They have verses that are there to give you the emotional balance that you need again. Hence, many of us go through these trials and tribulations constantly within our lives. We have our friends and family in our lives. We give them many pieces of advice. Do we tell them to read from Surah Al-Hadid and say to them, there are secrets of how to respond to trials and tribulations within the Qur'an. These are the things that we should first and foremost be applying. Lady Zahra sallallahu alayha would have known the commander of the faithful knew that there are verses of psychology within the Holy Qur'an. Would have known better than all of us where the verses of Surah Al-Hadid would have been giving him such strength from within. Hence, not only was she giving advice to him, she was giving advice to you and I. When you and I go through these trials and tribulations, let us read these verses as well. In these verses itself, in these verses it says, there is no evil. There is no evil that befalls the earth or in your own souls, except that it's already been written in a book. But Allah makes it manifest and this is easy for him. The subsequent verse says, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتُكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ Why? Why is this scenario taking place that evil may befall upon the earth? Look at the evils that we are facing within the earth today. Trials in Syria, trials in Afghanistan, trials in Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Egypt, Mexico, Bahrain, Palestine. The list goes on and on and on. There is no evil that befalls upon the earth, nor within your own souls, that happens to you as an individual, except that it's already been written. And Allah seeks to make this manifest. Why? So that you do not act in any manner of despondency. And that you do not act in a manner where you are overly joyed by whatever takes place on earth. Look at the balance that's being put. When something occurs in your life, when you are given, when something is taken, be it wealth, health, position, authority, whatever it may be, the reason why trials happen within the earth, Allah Ta'ala wants to see how you react to these trials. I do not want to see you becoming despondent nor do I want to see you becoming overjoyed in these. What do these words despondent and overjoyed mean? Ta'so comes from the root word ya'as. Ya'as means despondency. Despondency means to act in such a way where you are so sad, so despondent, that you don't feel like you can carry on. It's like me saying, you know, I'm going to stay in bed today. I'm going to wrap myself under the covers and I just don't want anything else to do with the world. Or that when I come across these trials, I've given up. I have no confidence, no hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will change my scenario for the better. This is despondency. This is when you have given up hope and you do not expect any good to come from your situation. I had health, it went. 
I had wealth, it went. Allah Ta'ala says, do not act in a state of despondency. Have balance within yourself. The next side, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ The word tafrahu, the root word is farah. Farah means to be overjoyed. It means a type of joy where you lose your spirituality. In Arabic, there are two words that can be there for joy. There is farah and there's surur. For example, in the dua that we recite here in Shah Ramadan, we say, Allahumma adkhil ala ahli quburis surur. We are asking for a spiritual happiness, a spiritual joy to enter into the graves. Farah, sometimes in the Holy Quran, can be used meaning joy based within dunya. Joy when you are overjoyed and you lose the sense of control within yourself. I am given wealth. Instead of looking after this wealth as has been obliged upon me, I may become a spendthrift. Or I may show off by this wealth. I may make someone else feel bad by this wealth. It may make me feel to be superior over someone else because I have this wealth. Allah Ta'ala says, have balance within yourself. I have given you all of this so that you are balanced as a human being. You do not become too disappointed and despondent when trial comes. And when I give to you, you do not become the type of person that is so overjoyed by it. You lose your characteristic of goodness. There is a tradition, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari was going through his own trials and tribulations. I'll give you an example of the levels of trials that Jabir was going through at his elder age. Jabir is narrated to have been the companion of the Holy Prophet of Islam who lived the longest. He died approximately three years before the birth of our sixth Imam. Hence you can see from the time of the Prophet, until just before the sixth Imam, how long Jabir lived. Hence, he saw so much. He saw time with the Prophet. He saw after the Prophet, the trials with Zahra alayha, and the commander of the faithful. He saw the trials from the second Imam. He saw the trials on the third and the fourth Imam, and indeed the fifth Imam. He has seen, witnessed, and as a companion of Ahlul Bayt, participated in so much of their own trials. To the extent that, uh, that the ahadith tells us that at the end of time he had become blind. One of the trials of life, his eyesight was taken from him. Another trial, the caliph of the time, before he martyred and killed Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari, burnt his hands with iron. Some of the actual traditions say molten, molten iron, that the iron had been melted. And he used this and poured this molten iron upon the hands of Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari. Trials of the highest accord. This is what the companions have been through for Ahlul Bayt. Jabir was sitting. He actually was in the presence of the fifth Imam. As he was sitting, he let out a huge sigh. <sighs> have you ever done that? You know, you come at the end of a long day of work. <sighs> oh, it's been a long day, huh? I can't do this anymore, it's too much. He let out a sigh. He let out a very large sigh from himself. Fifth Imam looked at him and responded to him and said, Oh Jabir, why have you let out this sigh? Was it because dunya was affecting you or because of akhirah? Why did you let out this sigh? Oh my Imam, I have troubles and trials within dunya. I have been through so much. My body is aging. My body is becoming weak. I have lost my sight. The enemies of Ahlul Bayt are taking out their oppression upon me. I am going through such trials and tribulations within this world. The fifth Imam wanted to teach him how to have balance within himself. Allah will give you Jabir and Allah will take. Allah will give you and He will give you trials with it. Let me tell you how you need to think your outset, your mindset, your look within this world. How you assess the world psychologically. Oh Jabir, there are six things to this world. Only six. To dunya, there are only six things. There is that which you eat, that which you drink, that which you smell, that which you wear, that which you ride, and that which you marry. There are six things. 
And each of these things have their own trials and tribulations. And each of these things have their own place of which they are coming from. O oh, Jabir, as for that which you will drink, the best drink that you can have is cold water. And Allah has given that in abundance around the world. Why are you fretting over it? O oh, Jabir, the very best thing that you can eat is honey. And that comes from bees. Why are you so worried about that which you eat if it's only going to come from an insect like a bee? O oh, Jabir, the best thing that you can wear is silk. Why are you so worried about the cost of your clothes if it comes from the backside of an animal? O oh, Jabir, the very best thing that you can wear as a scent is musk. And this comes from the blood of a deer. Why are you so worried about how, what expensive things you're going to wear upon yourself if it comes from the blood of a deer? O oh, Jabir, the very best thing that you can ride is a horse. And eventually your horse will pass away from this world and you'll have to get a new one. Why are you so concerned with this particular horse when it's only going to pass away? And O oh, Jabir, the best thing that you can marry is a wife. And indeed, you as a partner will give your wife trials and tribulations and your wife will give you trials and tribulations. Why are you so worried? These things are dunya. Look beyond. Be satisfied with what Allah Ta'ala has given you and don't allow yourself to be bogged down with the basis of dunya pulling you here and there. Jabir responded and said, from this day, shape, from this day onwards, my outlook changed within the whole world. I was no longer concerned with dunya. My world remained on how much I could get for my akhirah. It was all about the psychology. It was all about his outlook and understanding how he would react to a certain situation. Hence, we go back. We realize that this conversation has taken place from Surah Al-Imran when it mentioned about mulk. And this has gone all the way back from when we talked about Dua Iftitah, Alhamdulillah, and Malik Al-Mulk. Here we see that this is how a Mufassir or how you and I ponder upon verses, ponder upon a hadith, ponder upon ayat. We look within the Holy Quran and we see where this issue is mentioned. Then we see the associated verse. And then we see how this verse describes the issue in its entirety. Allah says, His is the entire kingdom. Indeed it is. He gives it to whom He wants and He takes from whom He wants. By virtue of me realizing whom He takes it, I realize that when he takes from me, I need to be prepared as how I'm going to react when he takes from me. This is one way we ponder. This is one way we ponder. But now let us review these verses again from the Iftitah and let us see how else we can apply our mind, our heart to these other to these very same verses. Alhamdulillah al Malik al Mulk, Mujril Fulk, Musakhir al Yah, Falik al Isbah. He is the one who is the owner of the kingdom. And he sets forth everything in its spheres. And he is the one who sets the direction of the winds. How do we understand this? We need to see these words again from Quran in order to see how we can understand. Why don't we take this time and understand this issue from the scientific. Why don't we take these very same verses and understand them through the scientific? Let me apply my scientific mind to this. Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk. Mujri al-Fulk. What does the word fulk mean? If we go to Quran, we find the word fulk has been mentioned in Surah Al-Yaseen. A verse that you and I know very well. لَلشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرَ وَاللَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارِ all of this, the sun and the moon, they float on a spear. Fulk can mean literally to float upon a sphere. But because it means something that moves in this direction, when you take it away from the literal meaning, we mentioned yesterday there is the haqa'iq and there is the majazi, there is the literal and the metaphorical. When you take fulk to the metaphorical, it is translated in the English language as either being planets or ships. So let us translate this. Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk, Mujril, Fulk. 
All praise belongs to Allah, who is the owner of the kingdom. He sets forth the direction, the movements of the planets. Or he sets forth the direction, the movements of the ships. Falikil isbah, and the direction of the winds. It's a nice sequence here, right? When we have our ships, of course today we probably have many of our motors and we're able to use the motors, but at the time of revelation, they'll be reliant upon the movement of the winds in order to make the ships go forth. Hence, when I see this, I see my Lord says, He is the owner of the kingdom. One. Two. He is the one who sets forth the direction of the ships. And he is the one who sets forth the direction of the winds. Now what if I was to look at this a little bit more scientifically? What if I was to take the other meaning and say, My Lord, you actually meant planets. I understand there is a clear flow, a sequence taking place. Ships are moved by winds. I understand why you would put these two next to each other. I understand why the Imam in Dua would say, All praise belongs to Allah who sets the ships in motions and he uses the wind to move the ships. But if I was to change the word ships, fulk, to planets, how would I ponder upon this verse scientifically now? What would I say about this? What is the relationship between the planets and the movement of the planets and the winds? When I look at it scientifically in the 21st century, with the scientific knowledge that we have gained, I find indeed, even in the atmospheres above, even in the direction of space, there is wind as well. How do I know this? We are termed with solar winds. Let us retranslate this. Alhamdulillah al Malik al Mulk. All praise belongs to Allah, owner of the entire kingdom. Mujri al Fulk. He is the one that moves all the planets. Falik al Isbah. And he makes the direction of the solar winds. What are solar winds? Solar winds are particles from the sun that leave the gravity of the sun and are sent towards the earth. By virtue of it hitting the earth, we are able to see this change even within our atmosphere. To the extent that solar particles are that which make up the aurora borealis. When I look at the northern or the southern lights, and I see this beautiful movement of green and blue and orange within the sky. I ask myself, how does this take place? The fact is, in Dua Iftita, 1400 years ago, our Imam described Aurora Borealis. Alhamdulillah, Malik al Mulk. He is the one who is the creator, he is the owner of all of the kingdoms. Mujri al Fulk. And he is the one who sets all the directions, the movement of all the planets. He says that he is the one who, Mujrul Fulk, he is the one who sets forth all of these solar winds. This is how you take from the scientific. You begin to look at it in a completely different light and you begin to say, indeed, these truly are the words from an Imam. What if I was to take it in another direction? What if I was to say, let me take it in the metaphorical? What if I was to take another line and look at it in a completely different light? Falik al Isbah. What does Falik al Isbah mean? We translate it and say that my Lord is the one who opens up subh, he opens up the daybreak. So for example, Fajr is 6.30, uh, Fajr is 5.30. By the time it comes to 6.30, I already see that the sun has risen. I can already see that he is falik al isbah. I can see that he has opened all the daybreak. When you look at it again through the grammar, you see, no, it's quite different. Isbah means not just one daybreak, but many daybreaks. It's plural. He didn't say subh, and he didn't say sabah. He said isbah, falikil isbah, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa taala is making constantly all the daybreaks around the world. Now, where do I get this within Quran? Again, Quran, Quran, Quran. If I want to ponder, I go back into Quran to see where this concept would be made first. Where do I find the concept of daybreak within Quran? In fact, there is an entire chapter named after daybreak. Surah Al-Fajr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Fajr. 
وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر I swear by the daybreak and I swear by the ten nights and I swear by the even and by the odd Indeed, with these particular oaths, there is a huge level of meaning for the one who understands. What does it mean, Fajr? Does it only mean daybreak? No, it does not mean daybreak. When we look at the Ahadith, it doesn't mean literally the daybreak. Daybreak is metaphorical. It means the new dawn. New dawn of what? It means the new dawn of the periods within history. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Well, Fajr, I swear by the new dawn, He means I swear by the new dawn of Islam and the revelation of Quran. When He says, Well, Fajr, in this time in which we live in, He means I swear by the new dawn. Which dawn? The coming of Al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala, Farj al Sharif. I swear by the new dawns. All these new scenarios, new times in history that are going to take place. Hence, when you look at it Quranically, you again apply it back to Dua Iftitah. Alhamdulillah al Malik al Mulk, Mujil al Fulk, Musakhir al Liyah, Falik al Isbah. All praise belongs to Allah, the one who creates the new dawns within humanity. We used to be in such a state of jahiliyyah. Our Holy Prophet of Islam came. He caused the new dawn of humanity. In today's age, we are living in such a state of jahiliyyah. We look forward to the next dawn when the awaited Savior comes as well. Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk. He is the owner of the kingdom. Mujri al-Fulk. He is setting forth all the ships. And he is setting forth the daybreak. He is setting forth the comings of the new eras within this universe. What if I was to change the thought process again? What if I was to apply another question? I can look at it literally. I can look at it scientifically. I can look at it metaphorically. But now surely, the Holy Prophet of Islam has a tradition where he says, Zayinu majalisikum bi dhikri Ali ibn Abi Talib. Adorn your gatherings. Beautify your gatherings with the remembrance of the commander of the faithful. Now, if that's a tradition of the Prophet, imagine how much the 12th Imam would apply that to his words. Let us revisit this same line. But let us see Ahl al-Bayt in this line. Because surely he must be saying something deep about Ahl al-Bayt too. Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk, Mujli al-Fulk, Musakhir al-Riyah, Falik al-Isbah, what has this got to do with Ahl al-Bayt? It has everything to do with Ahl al-Bayt. All praise belongs to Allah who is the owner of the entire kingdom. Mujri al-Fulk. As we said, Fulk means ships. It means vessels. Which is the most famous vessel in Ahl al-Bayt? They are the Safina itself. They are the vessel of security and sanctity for all of us. The Holy Prophet of Islam has a tradition. He says, the similitude of my Ahlul Bayt are like that of the Safina of Nuh. He who gets onto this Safina of Ahlul Bayt, they are saved. He who does not becomes drowned. If I know the ship is really the ship of Ahlul Bayt, let me apply it to this verse. Alhamdulillah al-Malik al-Mulk, Mujri al-Fulk. He is the one who sets forth the direction of these ships. He is the one who sets forth the direction of Ahl al-Bayt. Mujri al-Fulk, Musakhir al-Riyah. He sets forth the winds. Which winds? The winds that journey, that take Ahl al-Bayt. Musakhir al-Riyah, Falik al-Isbah. As we said, Falik al-Isbah is the new coming of each era, of each dawn. The commander of the faithful in sermon number 99 of Nahj Balagha says, the similitude of Ahl al-Bayt are like the stars within the sky. When one sets, another one rises. Just this way we are saying that indeed, 
that when you find that new dawns come, one comes after another, after another. When the commander of the faithful is martyred, Imam al Hassan is the new dawn. When Imam al Hassan is martyred, Imam al Hussein is the new dawn. When Imam al Hussein is martyred, Imam Zain al Abidin is the new dawn. And indeed, when Imam Hassan al Askari is martyred, the new dawn is the Imam of our time, al Hujjajjir Allah Ta'ala Farj al Sharif. This is how we ponder upon Quran. This is how we ponder upon du'a. And we try to take it in its directions. We try to understand it for the depth. The Imam, the Imam is given these words. Imagine the layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of meaning that is within this du'a. When I take the du'a, the first thing I'm obliged to do is look at it through Quran. Where is this verse found within Quran? What do I know is the meaning of this verse? Where is this verse taking me in a direction? And then I apply it back to the du'a. In one small sitting, simple sitting, we can look at these very same words and we can take it from the literal. We can take it to the scientific. We can take it to the metaphorical. And we can take it to Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all. This is how we want to inculcate amongst ourselves, our family members, our friends, our youth, that we don't take these words lightly. These are the words of our Imams. They are the speaking Quran. They are the ones who give to us the lessons that we can take. There is no doubt that the greatest lessons that can be given to you and I come from the 10th of Muharram. There is no doubt that when it comes to the tragedy of Aba Abdullah, it is nothing short of an entire university within itself. 10th of Muharram was the grandest, saddest trial and tribulation to before all of them. And just as we read in this verse of Quran, Likayla so ala ma fatakum wala tafrahu bima atakum, learn how to balance yourself in reaction. Learn how that you need to react when it comes to what you are faced with in this world. There is no greater example of any human being bearing a trial and tribulation better than Sayyida Zainab Her two magnificent sons, Owen and Muhammad, fighting the heat of the Iraqi desert is burning their tongues. It is burning their throats. They are calling out for just a cold glass of water, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. As a mother, they cannot give anything. As an uncle, they cannot give anything to these two young lions of Ahlul Bayt. Only Muhammad enter into the battlefield together as a partnership. They come and they strike the enemy and submit many of them towards the hellfire. But eventually they are separated. As they are separated, they are calling out towards each other, Oh, own, are you okay? Oh, Muhammad, are you still okay? Look at the braveness of these two young soldiers. They are not just concerned for themselves, they are concerned for their brother. In the end, one is struck down, he falls towards the floor. He calls out towards Aba Abdullah, Alaykum minni salam. Oh, my uncle, please accept my final salutations. Aba Abdullah runs towards own. He comes towards own and he sees him lying bludgeoned upon the floor. One narration tells us that this brave lion of Allah says, Oh, my dear uncle, I am unaware of what has happened towards my brother. Leave me for a few minutes and go and find what has happened to my brother. He goes towards the other brother. Imam al Hussein sits with him. He also comes and says his final salutation towards his Imam. He passes away from this world. He returns back towards Own, but he does not have a chance to see Own because Own has also passed away from this world. He returns back towards Sayyid Zainab. Oh, my dear sister. 
I tell you what happened toward your two children. Where is Sayyida Zainab found? She is not found with the other women crying. She is not found with the other women saying, Ya own, O Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon you. Sayyida Zainab is found in the tent performing sajda shukr. Oh my Lord, thank you for giving me this opportunity to sacrifice in the way of Abu Abdullah. But then having returned back towards Medina for this final time, having gone back towards the city of Medina, she enters and she throws herself towards the grave of her grandfather. Oh my grandfather, Ya Rasulullah, did you see what took place on the 10th of Muharram? Did you see how they took the arms of my brother Abbas? Did you see how they thrusted a spear into the chest of Akbar? Oh my grandfather, did you see the head of Hussein raised her eye upon the spear? And then she comes back into her house for that first time. And her husband is asking for news. She is for this worst time able to cry for her two children. She enters into that room where her two sons were going to be sitting, where they were living, where they were sleeping. She comes and sees these two small musalla. She pulls them down and cries for the first time upon own in Muhammad. ألا لعنة الله يا للقوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلب ينقلبون إن لله وإن إليه راجعون. Please raise your hands and join us in du'a. We pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى through the wasila of Sayyid Zainab صلى الله عليه to hasten the reappearance of the awaited Savior. We ask you, Ya Allah, allow us to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. We ask you, Ya Allah, if we are to pass away from this world, to raise us from our graves so that we may be alongside him to participate in his victory. We ask you, Ya Allah, through the wasila of Sayyidah Zainab, that we are expecting in these next few days heavy battles to take place, especially in the city of Halab. Ya Allah, this is the land of Sayyidah Zainab in Ahlul Bayt. This is the land of trials and tribulations. Ya Allah, as lovers of Ahlul Bayt, we have had so many opportunities to go and visit we have had opportunities in peace and in calm to go and sit in the haram of Sayyidah Zainab and Sayyidah Raqayyah. Ya Allah, we ask you to grant them safety and victory so that for the rest of our lives we can also return there in safety and security. We ask you, Ya Allah, there are many people around the world who are going through trials and tribulation and illnesses. Grant them shafa'ah. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to perform the ziyarat of all of Ahlul Bayt. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to understand Quran and Sunnah better. We ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum, jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.